Breaches and cybersecurity incidents are making headlines every day. What are you doing to be prepared? Welcome to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast, brought to you by Tripwire, the show that explores cybersecurity for the enterprise and how to identify and protect against cyber threats before they happen. Listen for techniques and best practices to harden your defenses against hackers. Now, here's your host, Tim Erlin. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for spending some time with us on this Tripwire podcast. I'm Tim Erlin, Vice President of Product Management and Strategy at Tripwire, and I have the pleasure of being the host uh, for this podcast. And today I'm joined by Travis Smith, Principal Security Researcher at Tripwire. Welcome, Travis. Thanks, Tim. Glad to be here. Glad to have you. So, Travis, just to start off with, what does being a security researcher at Tripwire actually entail? What do you What do you do on a day to day basis? Yeah, so one of the the cool things is I get to uh, look at the the latest trends in the security world and see what's going on, uh, and really how they relate to you know our products and our customers. Uh, really, with a, a mind on a defensive focus. Uh, there's a lot of security researcher type jobs out in the world. Um, the majority of them probably focus more on the offensive side, where they're you know looking at hacking things or reverse engineering things. Uh, and we're really, mo- mo- you know, my team is really focused on the defensive aspects. How do we detect the attackers and how do we stop them? So you're not spending your time tracking down criminals and taking down botnets. You're you're more focused on how organizations can protect themselves uh, from those types of attackers. Exactly. Yeah. As exciting as it would be to to track cyber criminals across the world, uh, yeah, we're really more focused on the practical things for uh, enterprise businesses. Well, and I think the reality is that most organizations spend more of their time on that defensive side of things than than tracking down criminals and and you know taking out uh, attackers. So it seems like it's more relevant to to where where customers need need help. Exactly. I mean, if you look at like cyber threat intelligence, uh, you know, there is the whole concept of attribution all the way down to you know, indicators of compromise and uh, anything in between. And while looking at attribution and who's behind those things is, is really cool, uh, there's not a ton of value for most businesses with actually knowing you know, who that person is behind the keyboard. Yeah, I always think that's interesting. The, um, the, the activity in the industry doesn't always map particularly well to the value that, that customers or that organizations need. And so there, there seems to be, you know, a, a fair amount of, of uh, you could go so far as product, but sometimes it's just press uh, that doesn't really solve a problem for a customer. I don't, has that been your experience as well? Yeah, it's pretty much the same thing. Uh, it's exactly, you're exactly right. Right. So I know that, that one of the things that you've spent a fair amount of time on lately is the, the MITRE attack framework. And for those of, of uh, those folks in the audience who aren't familiar with the MITRE attack framework, can you just start by explaining a little bit of, about what it is? Uh, yeah. So the attack framework for MITRE, um, the attack is really just an acronym for adversarial tactics, techniques, and common knowledge. Uh, so the, the cool thing about it is it brings together a lot of this uh, valuable information that defenders can use. Um, so it's broken out into... Um, quite a few different tactics. Um, so things like persistence or lateral movement, uh, exfiltration of data. Uh, and then within each one of these different tactics, we have a huge number of different techniques. Uh, so if an adversary wanted to, uh, you know, gain persistence with your environment, there are, you know, a, f- you know, a couple dozen different techniques that they could leverage to actually uh, achieve that different tactic. Uh, so they can use things like, uh, you know, accessibility features uh, or uh, external remote services or, you know, all these different things uh, to be able to gain that persistence. And then when you dig into these different sets of techniques, there's a ton of data within each of these techniques. So it describes what this attack uh, might look like, what it, you know, how they would use it, uh, um, real world examples of malware families or APT groups that have been leveraging these. So it's not just... Uh, you know, a, a researcher like myself presenting at Black Hat or DEF CON saying, here's the art of the possible. It's actual real world examples of it being used. Uh, and then breaking it down into uh, how you would mitigate that type of uh, abuse on your systems. And uh, if you can't mitigate it, how you might be able to detect it. So there's a ton of knowledge in here. So we should think about it at the top level as being a, a, um, a list of tactics and then underneath those tactics, specific techniques that are or other way around techniques and tactics. Uh, yeah, so the, if you kind of think of it under like the Excel uh, thing, so the the top row um, is your your tactics. So each column is a tactic, and then there's a ton of techniques in each row underneath those right. ta- tactics. And how many tactics does the attack framework contain, roughly? 
Uh, I believe it's 12 now. Um, it okay. used to. It originally was uh, 10 for the longest time, and now they've added a couple more. I believe it was Impact and Initial Access are the, the two new ones to the so field. So I think it's important. It's not an unmanageable list of tactics. It's something that a, an organization can kind of wrap their head around in terms of, of, of you know, focus. Yes. I mean, the, the, although there's a small number of tactics, there are uh, a couple hundred different techniques that map across those. Yeah. And but that's still type- not unmanageable. Yeah, that type of categorization makes helps helps us as as defenders make sense of of the the threat landscape. Absolutely, uh, you know, I've seen a lot of uh, organizations that they'll focus specifically on uh, an individual tactic at a time. So instead of trying to just chew this entire elephant, you know, they're just taking on um, you know persistence and making sure that adversaries don't gain persistence, and they can just go through that you know through this list to say, okay, I'm going down this list and making sure I'm addressing each one of these. Mm-hmm. So you mentioned let's just what were some of the the, the tactics again? Uh, you mentioned persistence as one example. What are a few of the others? Uh, so there is uh, I can just list them all off right now. Um, there's initial access, um, how they would first get into your system. There's execution, uh, how they would just you know execute their malware, just other things. Uh, I already mes- mes- uh, mentioned persistence, uh, privilege escalation, how they try to you know escalate their permissions to get you know administrator or root level type access. Uh, defensive evasion. Uh, this is how they try to, you know, avoid tools, uh, security tools, AV, things like that. Uh, credential access, how they're trying to actually access valid credentials so they can try to hide themselves a little bit better. Uh, discovery, where they're just learning that uh, information about the endpoints, uh, you know, processes running, uh, all that kind of stuff. Uh, lateral movement, where they can hop across machines within your environment. Uh, collection, where they're gathering data within your environment. Uh, command and control, um, where you know they're actually interacting with the, the endpoint themselves. Uh, exfiltrate, exfiltration, sorry, uh, where they're actually getting out that information that they collected. Uh, and then finally, impact. Uh, and impact was mostly added to address things like ransomware. Hmm, that's interesting. So this isn't, um, is impact one of the newer ones you mentioned? Uh, impact, is, I believe, is the newest one, yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, so the the data inside of the attack framework, the, the actual tactics, tactics and techniques aren't, aren't new, but the collection of them into a framework is something that's relatively new. Uh, you know, attack has been around for a little while, but not a long time. What's the point of, of collecting these uh, tactics and techniques into a framework? How is this useful to, to defenders? Uh, having that common body of knowledge is really the valuable thing. Um, as, as you mentioned, you hit it spot on. A lot of these are really old things like uh, accessibility features, which was one of my favorite when I first started learning about security, uh, where you just jam on the shift key on a Windows machine and it brings up uh, you know, a dialog box and you can change that to, to launch any process you want, like uh, you know, cmd.exe, and then all of a sudden you have you know, root access to the machine. Uh, so some of these have been around for a long time, um, and they've just been scattered all throughout the internet, or in you know in books, or in, you know in the minds of security professionals, and, and you know trying to defend these things. Uh, and the value of it is it is just bringing all that information together into a single place. Uh, if we look at uh, a lot of the security frameworks that we have available, or hardening benchmarks, we have CIS and DISA. Uh, those really harden it, but it doesn't tell you how to detect things. Uh, if we look at things like PCI. Um, really good, but really reactionary. So it's really behind the ball. Uh, and the the real good data that's coming out of this for me is really the detection aspect of it. And that's something that hasn't really been widely shared uh, in the information security world uh, outside of you know sharing IOCs or just small private uh, sharing groups. Uh, so there's a lot of value in, in this detection stuff. You're listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Thousands of organizations rely on Tripwire to serve as the core of their cybersecurity programs. Why? Because we detect suspicious activity before it becomes a breach. Our systems work on-site and in the cloud to find, monitor, and minimize a wide range of threats. With deep system visibility and automated compliance, we help you shorten the time it takes to catch vulnerabilities and ensure your organization is following the absolute best practices in cybersecurity today. Learn more at tripwire.com. That's tripwire.com. So w- one of the other areas of, of the, the cybersecurity industry that, that's gotten a lot of attention um, in the recent past is, is threat intelligence in general. And there are a number of, of commercial threat intelligence services. How do you differentiate or, or how are they, they related, uh, you know, these threat intelligence services and the attack framework? 
Yeah, so threat intelligence means different things to different people. Uh, so threat intelligence to some people could just mean consuming indicators of compromise uh, or just referencing a piece of uh, you know, executable and uh, throwing it up to something like virus total and saying, is this bad or you know, tell me a little bit about this information. Uh, threat intelligence to you know, another group might be you know, going all the way up the stack to doing attribution and things like this. Uh, the, the attack framework itself you know, is really you know, threat intelligence at its core. Um, they have, you know, the, the MITRE group has actually defined a different group. They call them groups. Uh, these are APT groups. So uh, your bears and your pandas of the world uh, where they say uh, this APT group, we've seen them in the, in the wild and, you know, in different uh, enterprises. And here's the techniques that they're using. Uh, so if um, a bank, for example, wanted to look at, you know, what are the APT groups that are attacking banks? They could look at something uh, in the MITRE attack framework and say, here's the techniques that they're leveraging at this APT group that's attacking banks. Here's what they're using. Uh, so me as a defender of a bank, for example, would say, okay, well, these are the techniques that might be most important for me to make sure I'm getting spot on. And I, I realize that, that you're not necessarily a, a representative for the attack framework. And I'm, I'm, I'm asking you questions that, that you may not be able to answer at this point. But I'm curious if, do you know where the data comes from for the attack framework, as you describe it, that's information that, that needs to be kept up to date. It requires resources to go to go get. Uh, how do how does MITRE ensure that it's it's actually valid information when they pass it along? Yeah, so all of the or not all, but most of the the data that's coming from the attack framework is coming from contributors. Um, you know, Tripwire is a contributor to the attack framework. Uh, if you look at each one of the individual techniques, uh, it'll give you a list of the people that have contributed to the framework. Uh, so the you know when we find something new and novel that uh, adversaries might be uh, using or leveraging, uh, we we provide that data to MITRE and they they look at it all, they correlate it all, uh, and they the team there um, does a really good job of curating this knowledge and uh, adding what's relevant, uh, dropping what's not, making sure that this uh, framework doesn't just get blown up out of proportion. Uh, so the the team there does a really good job of you know adding the the relevant stuff based off of. Uh, you know, open source contributed uh, tr- contributors, and and do the contributors include uh you know enterprises, private organizations, in addition to to vendors who are who are obviously interested in a, a commercial attachment to the framework? Uh, yeah, so there are um a lo- it's mostly a lot of uh, security organizations, but it's it's they're open to anybody. Um, if you are uh, a high school student that just you know is looking at some things, you can contribute to their framework. If you're um, you know a principal security researcher at Tripwire, you can do things. If you are just defending uh, you know mom and pop shop or any kind of enterprise, you can contribute to it. They're open for anything. Hmm, interesting. Uh, and I know, I mean, the, the the evidence that they're doing a good job is in the in the value that organizations get from the framework. And I know in in conversations with customers, we've experienced that they've had a strong interest in the attack framework, and they've um, employed it and, and implemented it in a variety of ways. So let's talk a little bit about um, how organizations can actually use the the attack framework. Do you have a a, a couple of examples of, of how it's useful to a, a specific organization? Yeah, when organizations bring it in, uh, I see them uh, starting to leverage it in, in one of two ways. One was looking at it on a tactic by tactic basis, is what I mentioned earlier. Uh, but another one, what they're looking at is splitting it up into um, looking at how they can mitigate things and how they can detect things, and, and putting those into two separate different categories. Uh, you know, from a security operations team, those are really two different distinct uh, you know, jobs: uh, hardening a system versus actually uh, detecting things that are going on on a system. Um, so when they're hardening things, it's really just about going through and looking at the the hardening uh, or mitigation guidance that they provide. Uh, and the the most recent, uh, I shouldn't say most recent, the the July update from Attack uh, did a really good job of providing mitigation categories. Uh, so they, they're breaking it down much easier if, if you want to to mitigate these things. Uh, but just doing something like CIS or DISA hardening gets you a lot of the way there. Uh, but from the detection category, um, it, it, there's still some work that they need to be done to to increase that out. Uh, the the best way to do it is really um, you know red team your own uh, systems you know attack your own systems. Some organizations might not have a dedicated red team. Uh, and, you know, actually, I would probably say a lot of organizations don't. Uh, so there's a lot of tools that are available to do it, uh, and there's usually about two uh, or actually three, I should say, that I recommend people look at. Uh, one is the attack evaluations uh, that Mitre has actually done. Uh, they have uh, already gone through round one. Round two is coming up in 2020. Uh, but they provide detailed step-by-step uh, 
actions what they did against uh, a wide array of different security vendors. Uh, so they had 20 different steps that they went through uh, using tools like PowerShell Empire or Cobalt Strike, uh, which are tools available to anybody. And they documented all of it of you know the step-by-step process of what they did. So if you don't have any experience in red teaming, that's a really good tool to be able to use and you can follow their, their uh, process. Uh, another one is Atomic Red Team, uh, which is uh, available on GitHub, uh, which maps directly to the attack framework, and they provide uh, detailed step-by-step things. So if you want to test uh, accessibility features, for example, I'll just keep hammering on that one, uh, you can go to their uh, their Atomic for that page, uh, for that technique, and it just says copy this command line or copy this PowerShell uh, command. Uh, so you could just almost a direct copy and paste from GitHub into your own machines, uh, and you'd be able to see, you know, was this successful or was it not? Uh, or, you know, if it was successful, you can then look at your detection categories. So it makes that really easy to to test both of those. Uh, and the, the really nice thing is that there are some of the more complex uh, techniques where you need like a custom DLL. The Atomic Red Team does have some of those and they're, they're benign in the, the DLL source codes on there where it just throws a pop up and says, yeah, this was successful. Uh, so you're not just downloading some random DLL off the Internet. Uh, and then the last one is a tool also from MITRE called Caldera, uh, which essentially uh, almost takes exactly what Atomic Red Team is doing, but it automates a lot of it. So you can start chaining uh, the techniques together where you can do a set of techniques uh, step by step all in one shot rather than trying to do them all manually. So it sounds like if you're interested in in starting a, you know, a red team within your organization, that the attack framework might actually and the tools associated with it might actually provide you with a, a good starting point. Absolutely. That's interesting because it goes a little bit, I mean, it's part of defense, of course, but if you're a defender in a position of, of you know, managing tools within the organization, but you're not doing that red teaming, this is potentially an opportunity and a way for you to, to grow your skill set. Yeah, absolutely. Right. It's a way to you know, move from, from blue to red or you know, become purple, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. So while the, the framework has been out there for a while, and as you said, there have been these evaluations, um, what do you think it looks like when an organization is successful using this framework? The success could mean a couple different things, right? So the attack framework isn't just a checkbox solution where if you, uh, you know, if you're tracking everything in the, you know, from a technique by technique basis and you're just marking every cell green when you're looking at the framework, uh, if you're covering every single technique, uh, you turn all of it green, you've mitigated against all these threats and you're detecting all of these different techniques Uh, you're still going to be somewhat vulnerable, right? There's still going to be different ways, you know, new novel ways that are getting in it. Uh, Really, it's all about, you know, making sure it's part of your process to assess your coverage, right? So if we look at adopting the the attack framework, most organizations will, at the first step, just assess their coverage to see what it is, right? And then identify what those critical gaps are. Uh, I mentioned one of them, uh, you know, looking at the APT groups that are relevant to your specific industry, uh, and then addressing those, uh, and then going back and then assessing your coverage again, and then identifying your new critical gaps. Uh, so by doing that and doing that continual coverage and that continual assessment, you're going to increase your uh, security proficiency. So it's not a one-time thing. You don't get to implement the attack framework and be done with it. You have to continue using it, um, especially when it's updated, but but also just because your organization changes, I suppose. Absolutely. It's, you know, it's like a carousel. You got to put your quarter in, you go up and down and around. Amazing. So that's very helpful. I think we've given folks uh, a few tips to on where to start with the attack framework. Um, Travis, I, I appreciate you spending the time with us. Um, anything that you'd like to share that we didn't talk about that I missed? Just take, take a look at the attack framework. Uh, take a look at the evaluations. There's a ton of data there if you've never looked at it. Fantastic. All right. Thanks, everyone, for spending a little bit of time with us on this podcast. Once again, I'm Tim Erland, Vice President of Product Management and Strategy at Tripwire. And my guest today was Travis Smith, Principal Security Researcher at Tripwire. And we hope that you'll join us for the next podcast as well. You have been listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Join us next time as we explore stories of people protecting people and techniques and best practices to harden your defenses against hackers. We'll talk to you next time on the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast.